Let's pray together. Father, we need your help even for this. We need your help to receive who you are, to hear your wisdom, and to enter your delight. So send us your Holy Spirit and help us. Amen. Friends, have a seat. Anxiety is the fastest growing and most pervasive mental and emotional health challenge today. It is present in every demographic of our society, young and old, those with little and those with much, in men and in women, across race and culture. We see it in every demographic, across every part of our society and community and relationships. It's worth noting that it seems to be more impactful, uh, the, this a- anxiety as, as a mental and emotional health challenge among younger generations, where it's reported at much higher rates. The sermon series that we're beginning today is on Psalm 37, and it is not a sermon series about clinical or diagnosed anxiety. If you need assistance, or you have questions, or you feel alone in a particular challenge in this area or something like it, please come and talk to a clergy or a staff person so that we can join you in this space, offer resources, and connect you to people that can be part of your team. I also want to let you know that our student note, which goes out every Monday, has resources for both young people and adults as they're experiencing anxiety, depression, and self-harm. Instead of anxiety, what we are leaning into, what we receive from Psalm 37 is an invitation to explore anxiousness and some of the spiritual rootedness of our whole person response to instability and insecurity, the way we respond to change and perceived chaos, because our whole person responds to it. And frankly, it makes sense for us to feel anxious because there is a lot going on. Have you noticed? There's a lot going on. In our own homes, we are experiencing job loss, relational stress. And if we're at all connected to the academic cycle, all of our like external rhythms and schedules just disappeared with summer, which is a different kind of crisis. In our church, we are church planting, which is amazing and good news and change. We are growing like crazy. And we've just begun the journey towards a new facility. There's a lot going on. If you go from your home and you come to church for a place of stability, this place has change right now. And it's good change, but it's still change. Within our nation, we seem committed to fractiousness and division, otherizing anyone who might disagree and thereby producing groups defined by their antagonism, blame, and misinformation. At a global level, we have more access than ever to the potentially destabilization of our world and fear-inducing realities of global conflict in terror. We have a right to be anxious right now. To a large degree, our anxious responses are the result of two factors. We sense a lack of agency and control. Things that we can't manage And beyond that lack of agency and control, we harbor false expectations and desires. We move towards anxiousness as personal kingdom builders 
seeking control and power and self-generated security and to satisfy the desires of our fickle hearts. Of course we're anxious. Of course we are. And so we read Psalm 37, which begins, do not fret. All right, that solves it, right? We're done. That's good news. That's all we needed. Let's get Daniel to come and lead us now because the, the, the response to all this anxiousness is like, oh, just don't worry about it. Simply directing ourselves or being directed not to fret or not be anxious. That's a fool's errand and is harmful. Which is why we know that that's not the fullness of what God has for us in Psalm 37. Because he would never invite us to evade or deny the necessary goodness and grace that he is bringing so that we can become increasingly the people we were made to be and increasingly grow in the likeness of his son. Over the next few weeks, we're exploring how we find refuge in God through Psalm 37 and its connected passages. There is a richness and a comfort that are for us who need it and for us who experience an anxious response to an unstable world. And I believe that it begins with delight. We can hear it as we continue through the psalm. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I've heard sermons in classes on this psalm that have left me dispirited, understanding that somehow I am at fault for being unable to generate delight. That, that somehow it's up to me to grab some proverbial bootstrap and not be anxious. The truth is, is that you and I are not the source of delight nor are you capable of sustaining it. In truth, we need to help, we need help to experience this unique combination that is delight, the combination of joy and satisfaction and contentment and excitement and peace. That's delight. And we need help to do that because it's not within our power to generate it or sustain it. For us to take delight can mean only one movement, and it is the movement of God towards us that invites a response. It's the movement of God to us, bringing us His delight so that we can take it. If we're told in the psalm to take delight, what we know very clearly right from the beginning is that it's not something we already have. It is in God that, God that delight lives. And so we can take it, we can receive it, and we can join the delight of God. I want you to imagine with me for a moment. If it helps you to close your eyes, you can, but you, you don't have to. But can you join me in an imagination of what the Father's face looks like when He smiles. Can you picture Jesus grinning? Can you sense and feel the pleasure of the Holy Spirit? If delight is God's and he is moving to us with delight, we have to ask ourselves, what is God delighted about? What is the source of God's delight? In the New Testament, delight is expressed 
through the term eudeko, which is often translated to be pleased. And there are two really clear instances of God's eudeko, God's delight and pleasure. One, as he gives his son, and the second, as he gives his kingdom. This is my son in whom I am well pleased, in whom I am delighted, says God at the mountain of transfiguration. Listen to him. He is gifting us Jesus, giving us the one that he delights in. And then again, and you heard it in our gospel reading from Jesus, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased, has been delighted to give you the kingdom. God delights in giving gifts, particularly the gift of Jesus and the gift of his kingdom, and he's giving those gifts to you. He is moving in our direction with these gifts. That which delights God is in fact our very salvation and life, which is Jesus, and our place and our person, which is his kingdom. We can continue that, that holy imagination practice for a minute. We can, we can hang in that space and imagine God giving us these gifts. Can you picture him offering Jesus to you? Can you, can you feel his joy, his pleasure in saying, here is my kingdom, have it all. God delights in giving us these gifts. Have you ever given a gift that you've been excited about giving? And, and maybe it's something, uh, maybe it was a birthday, but maybe it was just a random Tuesday, but you've been paying attention to somebody. And, and you noticed something that would bring them joy, that would be a kindness to them. It might have been something as simple as a handwritten note. It might have been something that you wrapped in like a box in a package and there was a bow. But as you come with this gift, do you know that feeling of being excited about giving it? That sense like, I, I took the time to know this person, to see this person, to recognize them, and there is something that I just, like, I'm just so ready. Have you had this feeling? This is something, I think, about how God would feel as he's coming to us, as he's consistently, constantly moving in your direction with his son and his kingdom. He's like, I've, I've wrapped it just for you. I know you and I love you and I have this gift for you. And he's giddy. He's smiling. He's excited because he has the perfect gift for you. His beloved child, you. There is something remarkable about this sense of God giving us these gifts because as he extends them to us at high cost to him and at low cost to us, he is smiling. And then, and then, there's this interesting thing about giving a gift, that as a gift giver, I can be excited about the gift that I'm giving and, and, and offering it, and I can have joy and delight in and of myself as I offer it, but it's not complete until it's received. There's something about the gift-giving cycle that re requires some kind of acceptance. Right? So maybe that's a happy laughter. Maybe that's joyful tears. Maybe there are other opportunities and things to consider as we accept. But delight, delight is that, is that thing that is already God's that we enter. It's a gift he is already bringing. He is moving in our direction. Not for us to generate but to join. And so before we go further, how do you recognize the delight of God? Not so much your delight that God provides, but the delight of God, the things that makes him happy and joyful and smiling. How do you recognize his delight? Can you take note of his pleasure in you? 
Again, his delight in you. Can you hear him speak your name like he did to Mary in her hour of distress and grief at the tomb? Before we leap to the need to have delight in the face of anxiousness, can we see Jesus moving in our direction with a smile and a gift? I think it's important for us to pause there and to begin practicing how do we notice what delights God. Because delight is a movement of God to us as he brings us the gifts of Jesus and his kingdom. The whole of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are always coming near to you. They are always bringing goodness and grace. They are always bringing delight in you. And because his movement lacks any anxiousness, his delight is our place of refuge. Because God is not anxious to give us all of who he is and all of what he has, we can have a refuge from anxiousness in his delight. But this movement of delight is not actually complete without our response. Delight is not full until the gift is received. We hear this in the impassioned plea of Paul to, in, in 2 Corinthians. And it's easy for me, at least, to get hung up in the first part that we read, this kind of guilted sense of failure or not being good enough in my struggles. And so I want us to listen through that to, to the end of it. Paul writes, this is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardships and in persecutions and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I get that point. I can, I can get hung up there and be like, I don't really luxuriate in all the hard things. I, I don't really love physical pain. Grief and loss are not the things that I want to celebrate. And so I can, get, I can get stuck there. And I want to invite us to move on because Paul continues, he says, how were you inferior to the other churches except that I was never a burden to you? Forgive me for this wrong. Now I am ready to visit you for the third time and I will not be a burden to you because what I want is not your possessions but you. I want you Paul writes. He writes it to this fractious and divisive community of Corinth that he has to go back to a third time. And he's still promising not to bring burden, but to bring gospel. I want you. The, the reason he can write about the challenges and stressors and hardships of his life is because he is existing in the delight of Jesus for the people of Corinth. And so we can even hear it from Jesus saying, I want you. I want you in your stress, in your change-riddled life, and in your anxiousness, I want you. We can, we can hear Jesus as we watch him walk through his life and take up burden and hardship and pain and ridicule all through his story because he's saying, I want you you and to express his desire he brings not burden but delight and so how can we respond what are our options because there's a spectrum of them on the first hand there's the spectrum of response that is just mere rejection no thank you i i don't want someone else's delight i want my own I, I don't believe that there's delight. I, I, I reject that there is a God who is loving me and moving in my direction all of the time with delight. That rejection can happen in anger and in apathy. That's one point of the spectrum for our response to this gift. In the middle... In the middle is like the casual, calm, hey, thanks. I, wow, 
thanks for your thoughtful gift. I, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's so good that you remembered me on this day. Th- thank you. This, this middle response of calm, of, of some kind of casualness, is frankly a habituated response. Because we might be used to getting gifts that are not true and that are not lasting and that are not meaningful and aren't even actually for us. But that's a response to the gift of God is the, hey, hey, thanks. Really appreciate it. That was nice of you. But on the other side of the spectrum is to just wallow in it, to be excited about it, to join this gift with abandon, to release this sense of pride and defensiveness about how we are perceived and just roll around in the gift of Jesus and his delight. Have you ever seen an animal wallow in mud? They're happy, right? There's a reason that's fun to watch, to see an elephant in like this this big old mud pile rolling around and it's because they're receiving something and they're not worried about what they look like. Friends, the option for us to receive the movement of Jesus' gift of delight for us is to wallow in it, right? That's the whole spectrum, Where are we in this response? Too often, I I sit right here, maybe just slightly right of middle with the kind of like habituated thank you. And it's hard for me to get over here to the wallowing and just like, I guess it's okay that God is loving me and I don't have to worry about what other people think about that. But that wallowing response invites us into the fullness of delight because delight is the true opposite of anxiousness. Often, we think that the opposite of anxiousness is calm or steady or put together. But frankly, that falls short of the glory of God with us. Anxiousness might prevent us from joyful, non-anxious abandonment of pretense and of fear. Here's some pictures of delight. Delight is seen in the over-exuberant first kiss of a married couple, right? Can you, have you been there at a wedding? That first kiss, or maybe the one that wasn't up front, but when they get to the back of the aisle at the end, we were at a wedding last night and it was clear that there was delight. And it was awesome. Delight is seen in the stories and memories of an old farmer riddled with dementia, telling stories of his godly life over and over again because it's the story of his life. That's delight. We can witness delight and be formed into it, into that holy reality of living in the the delight of the Lord through our Rwandan friends and family. When they greet you, they greet you with dance and not formality. When they feed you, it's with heaping portions of food amidst the lack that they have instead of on daintily designed, unsatisfying plates. When you're with our Rwandan friends, they practice touch and closeness and seeing Jesus in one another, even in former enemies. And they practice that over and above and against our attempts at isolating personal bubbles. This is delight. Delight awaits us as we experience God's movement of goodness and grace to us. Jesus says it himself, in the same way, there will be a glorious celebration in heaven over the rescue of one lost sinner who repents, comes back home and returns to the fold. When that happens, it's not a golf clap, it's a freaking party. 
It's delight. This is the gospel. That taking delight, joining the delight of God, entering the delight of the Lord is nothing less than our salvation and our healing. We are saved from the anxiousness of our worldly trials, and we are healed of our desire for self-sufficiency. The movement of delight is one that brings humility and combats self-reliance. And if the delight is the Lord's and not our own, then it is always available to you. It is always offered to us. In any circumstance, like Paul wrote, we are being welcomed into the delight of the Lord. In our stories of pain and physical suffering, the delight of God is for you. In our experiences of grief and loss, the delight of God is for you. In our stories of fear and uncertain futures, the delight of God is for you. Delight delight does not deny like the current reality of circumstance or suffering. But it gives us an opportunity again and again and again to orient our life to the delight of God or to choose something else. So how? How do we enter this movement of delight, God's movement to us with all that he has, all of his gifts of Jesus and his kingdom? How do we enter instead of fret? How? I, I'm ready for that, but I'm wondering how can we do that? How can we move away from anxiousness, malaise, fear, and timidity? What's our response? As we said earlier, take note of what God delights in. Our first movement in delighting in God is recognizing where He is delighted. And I would especially encourage us to do that in the Scriptures. I found that when we try to notice God independent of the Scriptures we often end up naming our fickle desires God. So notice the delight of God throughout your whole life and with the scriptures as a guide. And if we're noticing God's delight, if we notice what brings him life and joy and excitement as he moves in our direction, spend time in it. Hang out in the delight of God rather than trying to quickly move and be like, okay, now what's my delight? Enjoy the delight that God already has and experience that delight again and again. Note especially that taking delight in the Lord is relying on who he is in any circumstance because in any circumstance, he is still coming to us with the gifts of Jesus and his kingdom and his delight. And so as you mark your delight with God, you have permission to throw up your hands. And that can be like, I give up. And that can also be like, come on. You have permission to be content in a hammock without worrying what is next. To weep with joy. To enter his assurance with a cup of coffee. To know that you are loved as his child. And so if we're going to first start by noticing the delight of God, we need to mark the delight of God. Take note of that and to spend time in it. And then for us to remain in that delight to see it again and again, to normalize delight. Because what we've done is we've normalized the anxious response. We've normalized a life that denies the gifts of God, his, His Son and His kingdom. And so, of course, we enter into anxiousness. But can we normalize delighting in the Lord? Can we take note of where he has delight? 
Can we spend time in the way that he is delighting in us? And then can we practice that again and again? Psalm 37 concludes and, and, and frankly culminates this movement of delight in verses 39 and 40 where it says, The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take, the, take refuge in him. Our first act of refuge in God is seeing his delight and entering it because he has it for you. It's his delight. You don't have to come up with it on your own, but you're invited to say yes to it, to receive it, and to normalize delight. So take delight in the Lord because his delight is our refuge in times of trouble. Let us pray. Father, we need your help. Would you show us clearly your delight? Would you give us dreams and visions of what you delight in? Would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see the life of your son Jesus moving in our direction with joy as a gift? Would you continually bring us into your kingdom and say, here it is, it's all for you. Would you help us to experience your delight, to take delight in you, Come, Holy Spirit, and help us to receive your delight. Amen.